Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Karen Rimley, the director of the National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities at CDC. And um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rochelle Walensky, who is the director of the Centers for Disease Control. I'll turn over to you, Dr. Walensky. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rimley. Good afternoon. I'm really grateful to have this time with you and really to be able to talk with you directly and mostly to hear from you. Um, I hope that today's conversation can be an opportunity for me to listen. There are many things I could say, but really what I want to do today is listen and to learn from you on how we can do better, how CDC can do better, and how I can do better. I acknowledge that my words last week, though unintentional, were hurtful, and I'm sorry for that and for how they reflect on me, this agency, and our federal COVID-19 response. Those words don't represent who I am or how I've lived my life. I spent my academic career focused on breaking down barriers, increasing access, partnering with communities, and advocating for policy change. As a doctor in my own clinical practice, I saw each patient as a person, as a mother, a father, a child, an individual, and not ever as their disease or their disability. One of the reasons I'm in this role as CDC director is that I saw the devastating disparities and inequities that existed even before COVID-19 and which were made worse by this pandemic. And I thought in every opportunity to address them. Um, you just met Dr. Karen Remley. I know many of you know her already. She's here with us today because we take this work so very seriously with the disability community. I appreciate having this time with you and uh, how we can do more um, and learn more so that we can all do better. So thank you for taking the time. Thank you for joining. Um, thank you for convening us. And I'm here to listen. I'll turn things over to Bethany. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am also really glad that we could find a time to chat. Um, it would be really helpful for us if folks from the CDC, like Karen, who I've actually never met before, could introduce themselves in the chat. I don't want to spend time on that since we don't have a lot of time, but just to give us a sense of who else is participating. Um, and we, as I said, are very grateful this time for this time because we wanted to discuss specifically why this was hurtful and what our community has been experiencing over the past two years. And it sounds like you have some experience like from that, but it's very different from a provider perspective than it is from being a person with lived experience and being a person with a disability. Um, we're not here really to soothe our own feelings, but we feel that the CDC really needs to take steps to re-earn the trust of the disability community, not based exclusively on your comments, but based on policy actions over the past two years. And we want to establish a couple of things at the beginning, and, and we appreciate you expressing that you apologize for this being hurt. Uh, for us, for, for any folks that did feel hurt. Um, we understand you were referring to a study. We understand that your remarks were cut by the network and that others have taken them out of context. And we know that that must have been challenging in many ways. Um, but the study you were referring to, we represent the folks in that study who died. And those people with four or more comorbidities, those lives remain at risk at this point because of Omicron. And throughout the pandemic, we have been the folks who have died. So I really want to turn it over to Matt and to Julia and to Elena and Natalie to talk a little bit more about the experiences we've seen over the past two years. And then I'll go ahead and we can turn it over to some of the more concrete policy asks we have, but I'll start by kicking it over to Matt. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Fantastic. My name is Matthew Cortland. Thank you all for being here today. I am a senior fellow at Data for Progress where I focus on chronic illness and disability. At the outset, I want to apologize if I'm not at my best right now. My partner has COVID-19 and is isolating in the other end of our, our home. And as I am up at night listening to her cough, uh, as someone, you know, she has three or more chronic health conditions, comorbidities, four or more actually comorbidities. Um, I worry about her because her life matters a great deal to me. And I know that she's up at night worrying about me getting sick because I am one of the tens of, I am also one of the tens of millions of Americans with four or more comorbidities and I'm immunocompromised. I don't, I don't want to debate specific prevalence studies, but about 3% of Americans, including children and adults are immunocompromised. We are literally millions of people. I appreciate your apology. I understand that to some extent your remarks were taken out of context, but it is not at all encouraging 
to us or our loved ones that COVID-19 mortality amongst the vaccinated is falling disproportionately on those who are medically complex, who are immunocompromised, who are disabled, who are chronically ill. With that, um, I'll turn this over to Julia. Thank you again for being here. Thanks, Matt, and thank you, Director. Um, I'm also a person with four high-risk conditions for COVID and many other co-occurring conditions. I represent the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, which means I represent a community where people are already at high risk and it's common to additionally have multiple other disabilities and risk factors. What people with disabilities have heard consistently over the course of the pandemic is that our deaths are expected, inevitable, and less tragic than the deaths of other people. And we heard this message prior to the pandemic as well. We know it's actually the default implicit belief that most people have about people with disabilities. And sometimes this belief is expressed directly through words, but often it's expressed through actions like policy choices or through an absence of action. And over the past two years, what I've seen from my community is that many disabled people have looked at the policies put forth by the CDC and have been forced to conclude that the position of the CDC is that it matters less when we die. When you were talking about the deaths of people like me and you dismissed us as being unwell to begin with, you were saying what we've heard loud and clear for two years. I also really appreciate the apology and I think the disability community will too, um, but we're gonna need to see that apology really translated into those policy actions and I'm hoping we can spend the majority of our time talking about that. Um, thank you, I'm gonna pass it to Natalie. Good afternoon, I'm Natalie Keen and I'm here today on behalf of Justice and Aging and the older adults in our communities that have heard this message too, that their deaths are inevitable and their lives are not valued. And this is especially true for older adults with disabilities um, and for communities of color who are losing their elders because policy choices are not valuing their lives. So. So many of the people with multiple chronic conditions in the study you were referring to and um, in our country um, are older adults themselves and people with disabilities age. And we need to keep that in mind. This is not a monolith um, and we need to take specific uh, targeted actions with our policies. And that's what we're here to ask for today. Elena. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, thank you. Uh, I am Elena Hung. I am here on behalf of Little Lobbyists, a family led group advocating for children with complex medical needs and disabilities. And in addition to what the others have already said, I want to know, um, Dr. Walensky, that both your comment and your policy choices as director are also extremely damaging to chronically ill and disabled children who I assure you are watching and listening. I'm a mom to an amazing seven-year-old disabled daughter. Ziomara was born with a number of serious medical conditions, um, including lung disease and chronic kidney disease. And Ziomara is the reason that I do this work. She and I have worked together for several years now to help make policies more inclusive and accessible for kids like her. And your comments and your policy choices conducted in your leadership role as part of this administration undermine the work that we are doing to raise our children, our disabled children, to see that their lives are worthy. It undermines the work that I'm doing as a parent the work that my organization is doing across the country and the work that the disability community as a whole is doing to ensure that kids like mine get a chance to grow up. When chronically ill and disabled people are dying at disproportionate rates and the CDC is telling chronically ill and disabled children that that is their fate. And that is the part of the harm that is being done here that I wanted to raise for your awareness. Bethany. Thank you, Elena, um, and thank you all. I, I know that it can always be hard to share personal experiences, and I just want to thank you. And I am sure everyone else on the call would also want to extend that thanks. Um, yesterday, we sent you a letter in conjunction with a number of other disability groups 
detailing specific policy actions that we would recommend that the CDC take to better serve the disability community and to start rebuilding that trust. Um, I want you to be fully aware that we have also requested a meeting with Secretary Becerra to discuss things that HHS can be do. We understand that the CDOC is only one actor among many governmental actors. Um, and we are also, we've spoken, some of us have spoken to the White House and we expect those conversations to continue. Um, but we'd really like to get into a substantive discussion of some of the re specific requests and recommendations we have. Um, and so at this point, ah, <laughs> trying to keep us on time. There we go. Um, <laughs> so I will uh, then turn it over to, uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to Elena for a minute, just to talk a little bit about some of the communication that we think would be helpful and then to Julia. Oh, thank you. Okay, I'll try to be brief. So let's let's be clear that the trust between the CDC and the disability community has been broken. We acknowledge the apology you made at the start of this conversation. Um, and that is the first step, the first step to repairing our relationship, the first step to repairing that broken trust is a public apology, not just an apology to the organizations here, but a public apology from you, director, to the larger disability community. And the reason we opened this meeting today discussing why this has been so hurtful is because we don't feel that the CDC understands the impact of your words as director and the actions have on our lives. We don't feel heard and we don't feel represented by our government. Many of us here um, have served on the disability policy team that helped inform an inclusive platform for then candidate Joe Biden. And based on these policies, we worked really hard to help elect and put in office this administration. My organization, Little Lobbyists, um, endorsed Joe Biden specifically because of his explicit commitment to the disability community. He promised me that he would protect my disabled child's health care like it was his own. And he made that same promise to the disability community. And our community has shown up time and again to protect public health. We led the efforts to save the ACA when it was under attack. We were the first to go into and stay in lockdown when the pandemic hit. And yet time and again, our community has been forgotten. So when we tell you that we feel betrayed by this administration, please, please, please understand that we have been told in countless meetings and listening sessions by this administration, by you, that people with disabilities would not be left behind. And then we have spent the past year being left behind. And when we watch our disabled friends and family members die in congregate settings and die at disproportionate rates because of failed policies, it is a betrayal. When we are the ones who are most at risk in this pandemic, but have been left behind without reliable and adequate access to life-saving vaccines, masks, and testing, it is a betrayal. And when we hear you publicly say that it is, quote, encouraging news that we are the ones dying, it is a betrayal. And that betrayal warrants a public apology. Your commitment to rebuild trust and work with the disability community in good faith begins with a public apology based on an understanding of the harm done, specifically how the CDC's policies are directly related to the frustration we're feeling today. And most importantly, we need you to follow through on that apology through changed policies. And we are ready to discuss those policy asks with you. Um, and I'm gonna turn this over to Julia. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Elena. Um, so we're about to launch into those policy recommendations, and I'm, I'm hoping we'll have enough time to get through them and have a real conversation about them. Underlying those recommendations, though, is a key programmatic element that I want to highlight. The CDC urgently needs to develop infrastructure throughout the agency to support effective communication and inclusive policymaking with the disability community. I know we have a lot of disability representatives at the CWC on this call right now, and I really appreciate the work they're all doing, but I want to be really clear that when we say this, we're saying that what exists right now is just wildly insufficient to the need. Um, many organizations have repeatedly raised the need for an investment in this infrastructure over the last two years. Due to the absence of adequate support for this kind of real partnership and regular communication with the disability community, we saw widespread confusion 
at the state and local and individual level about which disabilities qualify as high-risk conditions, about who should be prioritized for vaccinations, what counted as congregate settings or long-term care settings, among many, many, many other examples. So we believe that regular meetings with disability organizations at both the staff and the leadership level within and across all centers of the CDC will help to ensure that the CDC is conducting the necessary internal education, that you're including the needs of disabled Americans in policy development from the beginning, no matter what that policy may be, and that we're improving the accessibility and the inclusivity of your public health messaging and implementing best practices going forward to prevent a lot of the problems we've seen over the last two years. This is a really crucial element of the work that the CDC must do to rear the disability community's trust in the interest of public health. Um, we could talk a lot more about that, but I'm gonna turn it over to Matt now to kick us off with some of the bigger policy recommendations. Thank you. And I just, I, I want to be very clear that I'm gonna talk about specifics, but Julia's point about including disability, chronic illness, immunocompromised perspectives in policymaking is the overriding goal. I am going to talk about specific examples. They are not exhaustive by any means. I want to be very clear. They're just meant to highlight, I'll be completely honest with you, Director, my graduate training is in public health from Boston University's Graduate School of Public Health. My Juris Doctor is from the George Mason University School of Law. I do this for a living. I do not understand how to operationalize CDC's technical guidance. And again, I want to be very clear. I don't wish to be unfair. I understand CDC's role is primarily in technical guidance in this, in this circumstance. I don't understand how to operationalize, for example, the technical guidance about isolation and quarantine that has been promulgated to both non-healthcare workers and healthcare workers. I know this has been, uh, it, it is complex and it is difficult to communicate about, but when CDC's guidance says that immunocompromised people are meant to be avoided by the general public. I, I don't know how to identify, like my, my, my immunocompromised state, my chronic illnesses are not apparent to the general public. We need to have a real conversation about how we operationalize this guidance. At the same time, CDC's guidance to healthcare professionals, and I, again, I understand that it is necessary as someone whose life literally depends on the healthcare service and delivery system remaining intact. I understand it is necessary that the service and delivery system continue. However, guidance that tells physicians and nurses and NPs and PAs, and I could go on and on, every single person in a hospital is important to make that hospital run, as, as you well know. When that guidance tells folks, for example, to leave, to go back to work while, while mildly, mildly symptomatic. I, I don't know what mildly symptomatic means. My healthcare, my treating healthcare professionals, the nurses who take care of me, in my physician's office at, at, at the, the healthcare system that, that you used to practice at, they don't know what that means. And my point here is, is that when guidance for quarantine and isolation is designed in such a way that people like me and the millions of people I represent are protected, that guidance protects everyone. If you are protecting us, you are protecting everyone. And right now we are not being protected by this guidance. And so I, I understand there are technical challenges here. Um, I, I still do not understand personally why the use of rapid antigen tests, I, 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 I've, heard the, I, I, I've, heard, I've heard your briefings with healthcare professionals. I, I understand what CDC has said so far, it does not speak to my concerns as a chronically ill, immunocompromised and disabled person who has to go to healthcare settings in order to continue to live, literally. And so reserving some number of, of rapid antigen tests for a population we know is positive for SARS-CoV-2, it's, it's literally one of the highest risks. It's almost a tautology to say that people who have COVID-19 are carrying SARS-CoV-2, but that's true. And so how, how do we target interventions to protect immunocompromised, disabled, chronically ill people who are, need to go to healthcare settings? How do we target CDC guidance so that when I am out in public, people, people are protecting me, people are protecting Elena's child? Um, these are, again, just top lines. I, I don't expect you to have nitty gritty details here. I, I want to be clear. I'm just saying if guidance is operationalizable in a way that protects me and people like me. 
it will protect others. The other thing I wanted to mention very brief, briefly is I, I know the administration has recently uh, announced a mask initiative. Um, data for progress, I, I, I looked at this, 39, 40% of people are still wearing cloth masks. You know, director, because I, you, you wrote about this in 2020. You wrote an invited commentary in JAMA, internal medicine, about how great N95s are protecting healthcare providers, if nothing else, if nothing else. When I go to a hospital, I shouldn't have to worry about source control, adequate source control, that the nurse has a surgical mask because there is no guidance forcing essentially for-profit healthcare operators like health, you know, hospital systems, nonprofit health across the board. This is not a siloed problem. We are seeing doctors and nurses not being given sufficiently protective PPE to protect patients. And your own words from 2020, I just, I do not understand the failure to issue guidance saying a surgical mask or an N95 is more protective because people look to CDC for this, even though, even though 40% of people, 39, 40% of people are still using cloth masks, people understand that N95s are more protective. We asked, I checked. I didn't wanna come here today and talk to you unprepared. And so this is the sort of guidance where if everyone is using a mask that provides better source control, and by that, just for the non-public health folks, we mean prevents them from uh, essentially breathing, spewing uh, SARS-CoV-2 viral particles into the air. That's what source control provides. If, if we're not, if, if, if there are steps available to protect everyone, to provide better source control, that will protect everyone. It will protect me. It will protect other people on this call. It would protect the people who can't be with us here today. Um, and that's the sort of guidance, just top line, don't want to go through a laundry list. I just wanted to give a couple of examples of the kind of policy making that if it were inclusive and worked with chronically ill, immunocompromised and disabled people would actually protect everyone. Um, and with that, I, I, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Mia Ives-Rubli from, from the Disability Justice Initiative at the Center for American Progress. Yes, thank you for um, taking this meeting with us. Um, uh, as Matt said, my name is Mia Ives-Rubli. I'm the director for the Disability Justice Initiative at the Center for American Progress. Um, I am here to talk, as, as you can see, I am a disabled person who is also Asian American, so I'm a person of color. Um, I represent a lot of individuals who have been significantly impacted by this community, I mean, by this uh, pandemic, and want to ensure that the CDC understands that the disability community is as diverse as the United States is. Accessibility is not just providing information in ASL and Braille. Accessibility means that we must include reviewing a number of variables, including physical access, virtual access, language and community access. For example, much of the CDC's guidelines and guidances are only easily available in English, Spanish, and ASL. That leaves many Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders to have to call hotlines to get information in their language. I've looked through your website to try and figure out how to gain access to um, really important information on COVID and could not find it and was referred to a hotline to do that. We know that the largest variance in obtaining at least one vaccine is within the Asian American community, comparing disabled and non-disabled people. So that means that we are critically missing a step in ensuring that disabled people of color are able to receive the vaccines that are so important and that the CDC and this administration have pushed. I also wanted to talk a little bit about the president's promise to make high quality masks and testing free. We don't know exactly what he means by high quality masks. So that would be great to know. Um, but one of the things that I think about is, you know, I understand that the CDC does not have control over distribution uh, and, and sort of those policies. But I do know that you all provide technical guidance to ensure distribution takes into account marginalized communities and the effects it will take to be able to 
ensure that people utilize the resources and uh, health uh, suggestions that, that are made. So requiring people to go online to find their closest testing system or testing center impedes communities from obtaining them. We know that almost 40% of disabled people don't have direct access to a computer and 30% of disabled people don't have access to a smartphone. And that's just disabled communities. We're not even talking about the internet disparities and transportation disparities. A recent article also, I wanted to talk about another thing, which was a recent article published by the uh, New York Times noted a difficulty for blind individuals to access testing. The CDC does not provide guidance or assistance in helping blind and low in vision individuals understand how to navigate these issues, which has forced many individuals who are blind or low vision to have to rely on others even if they need to self-isolate. So we have a lot of individuals who are stuck at home because they aren't sure if they have COVID and they want to protect the people in their communities, but aren't able to access tests. And there's a lot of different suggestions on how, and it would be great for the CDC to push for the administration and for manufacturers to develop ways to ensure that disabled people have access to these resources. Um, thank you so much. And I'm going to send it over to Natalie. Thanks, Mia. This is Natalie again. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about vaccine access specifically. Um, you know, and despite <laughs> repeated statements throughout this pandemic that people with disabilities and older adults are at higher, highest risk, it feels as though we have been thought about last or set aside as being too complicated in a lot of these decisions. Um, since before the vaccines were approved, we've been asking for specific consideration for all the unique needs and situations of people with disabilities of all ages and in all living situations. And some improvements have been made, um, but many of these issues continue to resurface every time decisions are being made about another dose or booster. And we are deeply concerned by the lack of targeted strategies to get vaccines to people with disabilities. And we want to see this changed. So for example, booster uptake in congregate settings is still lagging, especially in facilities where more residents are people of color. Inclusion of unpaid home and family caregivers, in, um, they have not been included in priority groups, the same as paid caregivers in the community. This must happen to protect the high-risk people that they care for. And to ensure protection of kids with complex medical needs and disabilities and enable their inclusion in school and our communities, we need a far more robust pediatric vaccination response. You know, currently it's um, around 20% of eligible kids that are vaccinated. And there remain many open questions um, with respect to uh, vaccine doses and boosters, specifically um, for um, people with disabilities. Members of the Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities Health Task Force wrote to you in October about the lack of clear guidance on boosters for people with pre-existing conditions that cause them to be at higher risk, uh, best practices for high-risk individuals in mixing and matching mRNA and viral vector vaccines, the relationship between someone who is high risk versus someone who is immunocompromised and who should be eligible for a third dose. And also for immunocompromised people, many, um, may remain unaware of their eligibility for a third dose and a booster or which comes first um, and, and how to get those. It's, the messaging has been very confusing. I'm gonna um, hand it over to Maria Town to talk more about that. Thank you, Natalie. And thank you, Director Walensky for your time. As someone with disabilities that make me high risk for COVID-19, I quite literally worked as hard as I could to get vaccinated as soon as possible. Ultimately, I received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, 
and have since had to navigate significant uncertainty regarding whether or not I needed additional vaccinations, which kind of vaccinations I could receive and when I could receive them. This uncertainty and lack of clarity and guidance specifically targeted at people like me has resulted in me engaging in further isolation, missing vital and necessary healthcare management opportunities. And just to put a, a really tangible point on this, um, my mobility and my health have declined, not as a direct result of COVID-19, but as a result of enforced isolation so that I can be confident in my ability to survive. But I am less confident in my, in my ability to re-enter society um, as we go into a post-pandemic era because of how my health has declined as a result of isolation and unclear guidance around vaccination. My experience is not that uncommon, something I am keenly aware of as the president and CEO of the American Association of People with Disabilities. Particularly for people with disabilities who are unstably housed or who have limited access to transportation, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, because it was one shot, was by far the most practical option. And so there are millions of people like me waiting in this uncertainty, just hoping that we can hang on to our health long enough to re-enter re our communities and broader society once the pandemic is over. In addition to the necessary guidance Natalie described, I, I'm gonna re-emphasize a point that many of my colleagues have made. The CDC should provide additional resources directly to immunocompromised or high-risk people, work with professional organizations, medical colleges, and others to ensure that this guidance is <clears throat> reaching practitioners, reaching the medical community, um, but, but that alone will not be enough. While this outreach to the medical community is important, there is significant distrust of healthcare, public health and medicine in the disability community. Um, some of this distrust was fostered by the actions of the CDC, um, but your agency is not the sole perpetrator. Um, people with disabilities are living with decades and decades of medical violence. Uh, this is a a whole branch of science that says we are we are defective. Um, and I, I know Karen is on the line. I heard her say a few days ago that she doesn't like the name of her agency because from, from the moment a child with a disability is born, it marks them as, as defective. Um, when, when you think about the role of medicine in people's lives, particularly people with disabilities, you have to consider those kinds of factors. And so it is vital that the agency specifically work with organizations serving multiply marginalized, high-risk, immunocompromised, and disabled people so that this guidance can be disseminated and translated by trusted actors. I know some of this work is already happening in both the CDC and across Health and Human Services, but as an example of how the COVID-19 vaccination outreach has excluded the disability community, in the hundreds of organizations that are partners in the COVID-19 community core, there is not a single organization specifically focused on the disability community. Not one. Um, we welcome further conversation on this. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Jess Davidson. Thank you, Maria. My name is Jess Davidson and I'm the communications director at the American Association of People with Disabilities. And the final point that we want to make today before I hand things back over to my colleague, Bethany, is that not only has the pandemic posed an extreme risk to people who are already disabled, it has also been a mass disabling event. And that is something that we don't feel that we're hearing represented in the top line message from the CDC or from other government actors. The truth is we don't know and we probably won't know for a long time how many COVID cases, especially in this current spike, may cause long COVID. And we've seen some study results that have estimated ranges as high as one third to more than one half of COVID survivors may develop temporary or permanent long COVID disabilities. As someone who has attempted to navigate accessing adequate care in this pandemic as a post viral illness patient, I have to say it is gravely distressing to me every time I hear it suggested that our society should simply accept that most people will get this virus, knowing how many millions of Americans might be grappling newly with long COVID at this moment. Until last January, I was in perfect health until I caught a run of the mill, mild, not COVID, winter virus, just a virus. We thought it would go away in a couple of weeks, and it triggered 
post viral illness very similar to long COVID, including intractable chronic pain, dysautonomia, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and severe chronic fatigue. What scared me most was actually not the fact that I was a 26 year old who one day could get out of bed and the next day I couldn't. What scared me most was how equipped more than 12 different doctors in six months seemed to be to help me. They did not know what to do. My mother, who has spent the pandemic as the charge nurse on my hometown hospital's COVID unit in Fort Collins, Colorado, collectively she and I could not determine how best to navigate the exact healthcare system and hospital in which she has worked for 13 years and from which I received competent care for the first 21 years of my life. I think just about any post viral illness patient would tell you that the structure of our current medical system is not designed to catch, diagnose, or long term or short term treat post viral illnesses. And I felt like I was falling through the cracks. Becoming newly, disa newly disabled or chronically ill during a global pandemic is an experience that I would not wish on anyone. As soon as I realized the increased risks that I faced by developing a chronic condition during this time, after hearing my mom's stories from the hospital and after witnessing the way that disabled and chronically ill people had been treated during this pandemic, there are no words for how scared and vulnerable I felt. Every time I went to the grocery store and saw somebody who wasn't wearing a mask, the message I received was, I'm done with this and I don't care if that kills you. It was one thing to receive that from people in society, but to be honest, since Omicron hit, it feels like the entire healthcare system, medical system and government have kind of conceded that point as well. And it has been the most painful moment for me personally, since when I realized how at risk I was when I got sick. I moved more than a thousand miles at enormous fiscal expense to get access to the doctors that I needed back in DC, something most patients cannot afford to do. And then I became part of the 25% of dysautonomia patients who get a diagnosis in the first year. Once I had that diagnosis, which I thought was supposed to be the hard part, it was still unclear how to proceed with treatment. Patients are suffering. Autonomic dysfunction has emerged as a common symptom of long COVID. We know that dysautonomia is a common feature of other post viral illnesses. In 2013, dysautonomia, bleh, dysautonomia International, say that five times fast, conducted a survey of 700 patients that found that the average diagnostic delay for those patients was five years and 11 months. 50% of patients traveled more than 100 miles from home to receive POTS related medical care. And prior to being diagnosed with POTS, 59% of those patients were told by their doctors that their symptoms were likely all in their head or a result of mental health issues. 27% of patients visited more than 10 doctors for their symptoms before being diagnosed with POTS. Please hear me when I say that if only 5% or 1%, let alone one third or half of COVID patients are becoming disabled by long COVID, far too many hundreds of thousands of Americans are currently suffering greatly while simultaneously being told that their suffering is not real or will resolve on its own in a few weeks. This is a great injustice. We appreciate the significant research that has been invested in addressing long COVID, but we believe that the CDC and the federal government as a whole must do more, not just on long COVID, but on post viral illnesses in general, about which the medical community seems to know very little at this time. People developing long COVID are suffering and are struggling to access care because of lack of research dollars previously that were not decided to go towards conditions like myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, dysautonomia, and fibromyalgia. Research initiatives on long COVID must include these similarly presenting conditions. And if the CDC cannot prevent these patients from getting COVID, then the very least these patients are owed by their government is for the government to be extremely committed to responding to the ways in which their health and lives have now been changed by getting this virus. Becoming disabled is not a tragic thing. It is a normal part of life and of the human experience, but becoming disabled and feeling failed by the medical system, your doctors, society, and your government is tragic and it is wrong. And the CDC should be prepared to use all of the tools at its disposal to embrace being responsive and responsible to the patients who did get this virus and who were lucky enough to survive it and now are looking at the rest of their lives. I'm going to turn it back to my colleague, Bethany. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. And thank you to all of our speakers. Um, I wanna acknowledge that we just read an extremely long laundry list of policy concerns and issues to you, but we did wanna reserve time for the CDC to respond or for any thoughts or follow-up questions that you might have. As Julia made very clear, we would expect this to be the first of many conversations we'll be having with different centers and with the leadership of the agency, but we really want, you know, we wanted to be respectful and we do appreciate you giving us this time. Um, yeah, maybe 
first, I just there's there's one piece I want to understand, and that goes back to Matt's your comments on masks, because I just want to make sure I understand where you are with that. Were you speaking specifically to healthcare settings or to population? The very least, the very least that I would expect is guidance for healthcare settings that insists essentially on N95s because as you've written in JAMA internal medicine, they provide better respiratory protection and source control. Um, it, it's a really a, the, the ask is one of the very least that we would expect, I think is for healthcare settings. As for the general public, the current guidance, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't quite understand CDC's position at this time. You issued a couple of tweets that said the guidance will always be to wear a well-fitting mask. I couldn't agree more. A mask will only filter air if it fits well, but cloth masks don't fit well. That's sort of in, and they don't provide very good source control. They don't, they don't stop people from, from spewing out SARS-CoV-2. They don't provide very good respiratory protection to the wearers, they, meaning they don't really protect you that well against Omicron. Again, I, I want to be very clear. I understand the science has changed. We're dealing with a new variant. CDC needs, you know, I, I fully understand that you need time to gather data, that you're an evidence-based organization, but we are now in a world in which Omicron is the dominant variant. It is, it is much more transmissible, according to CDC's own, own publications, than, than previous variants. And I would expect max, masking guidance to develop into to really what, what for me as a chronically ill, immunocompromised, disabled person I'm looking at is there is a thing that actually CDC guidance could do that would protect me a lot more than where we are now, which is 39% of people using cloth masks instead of either disposable surgical masks or N95s, which provide better source control and better respiratory protection. Um, and I'm really, when I'm, when I'm thinking about, well, I need to go to the pharmacy, they're wearing cloth masks. I know that's not stopping SARS-CoV-2. Um, so it's, it's really a, the healthcare setting, just because we are like, by virtue of our existence forced to go to those places. Like I, I had to go to mass eye and ear last month. I didn't have a choice. If I wanted to continue to be alive, I had to go in and, and 95, but people are still walking in with cloth masks and in, 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 in not all of the providers are wearing N95. So guidance that addresses healthcare settings would be the sort of the bare minimum. And then a broader population guidance that, that recognizes we are almost two years into this thing now. We are two years into this thing. Um, it's, it's time to move beyond cloth masks. We are no longer in the crunch in which you were trying to figure out how do we extend N95 supply so that they exist in the OR. Like we're, we're not in that crisis place anymore. 3M is, is doing news stories that they have plenty of capacity for their, their 3M ORs. I've, I've got, I, am, I am literally distributing these to folks who rely on SSI because SSI is $794 a month and you don't have the money to buy an N95 mask when you're living in enforced poverty. So really that sort of guidance, um, it, it's a broad thing. And I, I know there's a lot of data and I don't wanna you know, monopolize the discussion. I, I look forward to further conversations about this, but it's, it's a healthcare setting and then a general population setting. And if you protect me, Dr. Walensky, you've protected almost everyone. Yeah, um, so thank you for that. I will, I do want to sort of acknowledge that we're working actively on updating our masking guidance. Um, I think our masking website and information, um, I, I still believe that any mask is better than no mask. Of course. Um, and that, you know, wearing the best protection you can is, is, is you know, should be the optimal, right? Um, I do want to first say thank you for, for sharing your experiences, your lived experiences. Um, I can't pretend to understand all of your lived experiences, but hearing them is really, I'm learning a lot. Um, I continue to need to learn more. There's no question about that and am committed to doing so. Um, I think I want to acknowledge that I too have family members who are disabled. I have taken care of patients. I have community members who are disabled. And so um, I do bring with this a, a dose of understanding some of the disability communities. I can't, I don't know all of them, but some of them and, and am committed to learning more. We've done a lot since 
we started, we have more work to do. There's, you know, we started um, and we didn't have a disability metric on our website, which was intolerable as far as I'm concerned. Um, we now have a means of collecting data. Our health equity um, uh, uh, initiative that started this year um, is not just racial and ethnic minorities. This is disability communities and, and many other areas where we are committed to looking at the data. And I've said to my agency, um, we can't do anything about data that we don't know about. And oh, by the way, seeing the data is not enough because we need to take action. And I've actually said, I no longer want to report on inequities. I want to do something about them. And I've said that loud and clear to my agency. Um, we need to see the data first so that we know where to take those actions. Um, I know from my life from, from before coming here that the best way to do this work is in partnership. The best way to um, make a difference is to have the active voices at the table. Um, I'm committed to doing that. Dr. Renly has been a key part of that. Um, and what I will say is, again, I'm sorry for how hurtful my comments were. They were not intended that way. But what I do hope after this conversation and is to double down on the commitment um, because that moment that was hurtful for all of us, I think, um, mostly for you, um, is the motivation to lean in and do better. Dr. Walensky, Jamila Headley here. Um, I just have one more answer for you. I know that we are at time, um, but I really want to ask if you can make an explicit commitment to commit to ongoing meetings with you and with others on your team with this group of people. I know we made it as an ask, but I wonder if you can make a really explicit commitment to that and an explicit commitment to who will follow up with us to make sure that that happens. Yeah, what I'd like to do, I will commit that CDC leadership will be engaged, senior leadership will be engaged. Dr. Remley will most definitely be among those. I will commit to being engaged myself. I have learned over the last, year that I can't commit to anything in the next 24 hours. And so what I really do want to do is say, yes, I will be engaged. Um, will I be at every meeting? If I, I, I'm, I'm really true to my word and I don't want to commit to something I can't, I really can't do. But what I can say is we as an agency are committed to this, our senior leadership is committed to this. And if I can't be there, I will absolutely hear the lead out. Thank you. And thank you to all the advocates and for all the CDC folks who attended. And thank you very much again for meeting with us and listening to our concerns. And um, just Matt, you you explicitly noted that you have a loved one who is unwell. So please, I wish speedy recovery. Um, I hope that is not the case for others, but um, I wish you all, I wish you a speedy recovery on the Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We look forward to future conversations. We appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. And thank you, Bethany, for facilitating us so expertly. Yes. Always happy to keep us on time. <laughs> thank you, Bethany. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.